No, we're good. We'll wait up. It's okay. Take your time. Good? All right. Good afternoon. Let me start by saying again that we all continue to pray for all the victims of the Key Bridge collapse and also their families. Not a single day goes by that we are not thinking about each and every one of them, and we are all here to bring you support. No pasa ningún día sin que estamos pensando en todos ustedes. Y estamos aquí para brindarles nuestro apoyo. I also want to recognize our first responders and all of our emergency personnel. Whether you serve in uniform or whether you have raised your hand as a civilian, whether you are here and were here on the day of the collapse or you joined the mission this week, whether you were born and raised in Maryland or whether you traveled here from around the country, you are and you continue to be the very best of us. And we are deeply grateful. Now, this morning, I received a briefing from Unified Command, and today I will provide updates on the four directives that I've issued to our team. First, we need to give closure and comfort to the families. Second, we need to clear the channel and open the vessel to all traffic to the port. Third, we need to take care of all the people who have been directly impacted by this crisis. And four, we need to and we will rebuild the key bridge. First, on providing closure to the families. Last week, the Maryland State Police recovered the remains of one of the remaining victims. Maryland is praying for the family of Menor Sandoval and all of his loved ones. They're in our thoughts, in our hearts, and will always have our support. And in this moment, it's important that we not just recognize the tragic loss of these six Marylanders who perished during the Key Bridge collapse, but also remember the ways in which they have lifted our state up in the way that they lived. The night of the collapse, these men were tending to our state's infrastructure for our collective benefit. Their work had dignity. Their contributions will never be forgotten. On the day of the collapse, I said that we would stop at nothing to support these families. And the Maryland State Police currently has over 25 personnel assigned to recovery operations on a daily basis. Our Director of Immigrant Affairs, Adriana Lee, has been in direct and constant contact with each of the families. And we currently have 30 members of state government assigned to helping these families in their hour of need, and that work will continue. Second, on clearing the federal channel and opening the vessel traffic to the port. I've said it before, and I will keep on saying it. This work is remarkably complex. I ask you, I'll show you on the slide here what we're dealing with. So this over here, this over here is an aerial vision, an aerial rendering of what we have. As you see here, the dolly trapped underneath the bridge. The thing I want to point out here, and what's important to recognize, is this piece over here, as well as this piece over here, not only are they massive, and when I say massive, we are literally talking thousands of tons that are sitting on top of the dolly and thousands of tons on the other side of the channel. But also, as, as Paul Hankins pointed out, our, uh, our director of Soup South pointed out, also uh, Colonel Pinchason, that it'd be one thing if the part that you don't see here, it'd be one thing if it looked like that. It'd be one thing if the bridge kept its structural integrity. The problem is the bridge no longer looks like that. The bridge now looks like that. So as Colonel Pinchasen always and accurately points out, what we're seeing from the top is one image. In many ways, what's even more complicated is what we don't see. Because this part up top here is now 
that mangled remnants of the key bridge that now sits in the Patapsco River. So when we talk about the overall complexity of the operation, that's just an idea of what kind of complexity that we're talking about and the kind of complexity that all the members of the Army Corps of Engineers, the members of the Coast Guard, Navy Supsolve, that they are trying to identify and work through that type of wreckage with that type of damage that was done to the Key Bridge. So the thing that we know and we continue to highlight is we've got a long road ahead of us. But I'm proud to say the remarkable work of this team that we keep on moving. And last week, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers released an aggressive timeline for fully reopening the Fort McHenry Channel. And we are on track to open up a 35-foot deep channel by the end of April, and the length of that channel is also going to be 280 feet. And we're also on track to clear the channel and restore port access to normal capacity by the end of May. And we've already completed two temporary channels. One temporary channel is on the northeast side of the collapse with a controlling depth of 11 feet, and the other temporary channel is on the south side of the collapse with a controlling depth of 14 feet. As of this morning, there had been 58 commercial movements throughout those two channels, but let's be clear, even with those 58 movements, we're still only talking about 15% of what vessel traffic looked like before the collapse. So even when you factor in the vessels that are going to Trade Point Atlantic, the economic activity is likely even lower than that 15%. Since we are talking about that depth of no more than 11 feet, that we're also now talking about smaller cargo and smaller ships. So I want to thank our friends from Trade Point Atlantic for the work that they're doing and for raising their hands. And I also want to say the commitment to making sure that we can get a deeper channel remains consistent. And they have a channel, when you look at our friends at Trade Point, have a channel with a controlling depth of over 35 feet, and that has been instrumental in helping us to find creative ways of keeping our commercial operations flowing. So to the entire Trade Point team, we all collectively want to say thank you. We're also working to remove containers from the dolly, and this will help us to access additional parts of the bridge and to prepare to refloat the vessel. But I want to be clear on that as well. That work is complicated and that work is dangerous because just one empty vessel, just one empty container that's sitting on the vessel can have a weight of over one and a half tons, and that's an empty vessel. As of last night, we have removed 34 containers, and our present goal is to remove around 178 containers total. Third, on taking care of our people. Since they opened last week, our new Maryland Business Resource Centers have helped a combined 200 businesses. Yesterday, we opened a third permanent business resource center in Anne Arundel County, and that permanent site is located at 710 Aqua Heart Road, Glen Burnie, Maryland, 21061. I encourage everyone to visit sba.gov for more information on hours and resources, and please take advantage of these resources that are currently available. Yesterday, I was also proud to sign the Port Act into law. This legislation will support businesses and workers that have been affected by the collapse, and I want to thank President Ferguson, Delegate Clippinger, and also Senator Sailing, not only for their stewardship of this bill, but also for partnering with this administration in the entire process. Among the many provisions, this bill will create new permanent scholarship programs for the families of transportation workers who died on the job. And just like every other bill, that we introduced this session, every other bill that we introduced this session and last session, the Port Act passed with votes of both Democrats and Republicans, bipartisan support. Because in our Maryland, we don't just talk partnership. We move in partnership. It's part of who we are. And we all collectively have been working together 
since day one, across political ideologies, across party lines, across layers and levels of government. And we're going to keep on doing it because this is what we do. Now, fourth, on rebuilding. Yesterday, I visited leaders on Capitol Hill to discuss the rebuilding efforts with our federal delegation. And our federal delegation has been remarkable throughout this entire process. We met with leaders all across government, including Secretary Buttigieg, the Secretary of Transportation, the Director of the Office of Management and Budget, Shalanda Young, and the Assistant Secretary of the Army for Civil Works, Mr. Michael Connor. In fact, earlier today, Mr. Connor actually came and was in Baltimore and was with us on the ground and also then went out on the water. In our meeting yesterday, I stressed the importance of bipartisan federal support in this moment. The House and the Senate have a long tradition of bipartisan cooperation in the wake of disaster because on August 1st, 2007, when I-35 West Mississippi River Bridge in Minnesota collapsed, that tragedy resulted in the death of 13 people and the closure of a major thoroughfare. Democrats had majorities in both the House and the Senate at the time, and they worked with a Republican president, George Bush, to provide $250 million in emergency funds the day after the bridge fell. So now, members of Congress of both parties must come together again and act with the same level of urgency and partnership that they did in 2007. Now for our part, this administration is ready and willing to work with anybody and everybody. So to members of the U.S. House and to members of the U.S. Senate, my message is simple. Come to Maryland. Work with our congressional delegation. Sit down with me and my team. Get up close to the wreckage. See it for yourself. See what we've been seeing for two weeks. See what it looks like when a steel bridge falls on top of a shipping vessel that is the size of the Eiffel Tower. See what it looks like when a catastrophe that even the Lloyds of London has said could be the most expensive maritime catastrophe in history. See what that looks like up close. And while you're here, get to know some of the 30,000 commuters who used to travel across that bridge every single day. While you're here, meet with some of the 8,000 port workers whose jobs have been directly impacted by this tragedy. Get to know them. And then you will understand the importance of rebuilding this bridge as quickly as possible. I know we can come together. I know we can win this moment. And I know we're going to win this moment because we're going to choose to do it together. Every day, I meet more and more people who inspire me. More and more people who remind me what it means to be Maryland tough and Baltimore strong. And today, we're joined by Alex Del Sordo, Gene Rehack, and the team from Anchor Bay East Marina. Now, they started receiving calls from first responders at 3 a.m. the morning of the bridge collapse. And our team needed help getting fuel and supplies, and it was Anchor Bay who stepped up. They stayed open for extended hours to help those working in the, chest, in the key bridge response, and so far, they have served over 550 meals to our first responders. So Alex, Jen, and the entire team, Thank you for raising your hands to serve. Thank you for continuing to remind us why the state is so special. Thank you for reminding us what it means to be Maryland tough and Baltimore strong in this moment. Thank you all so much. And in a moment, I will turn it over to Lieutenant Governor Aruna Miller. And then following her, she'll be joined by the following speakers. Admiral Gilreath, speaking for Unified Command. Colonel Pinchasen, speaking for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Colonel Roland Butler, speaking for the Maryland Department of State Police. And Baltimore Mayor Brandon Scott. And I want to thank all of our additional partners that are here today 
and thank them for all of their work and service as well. I will now turn it over to Lieutenant Governor Aruna Miller. Thank you so much, Governor. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Aruna Miller, Lieutenant Governor of Maryland, and I'm honored to be leading the efforts with the short-term and long-term financial and economic recovery efforts for individuals and businesses that have been impacted by the key bridge collapse. Our administration's recovery efforts are guided by three core pillars ensuring that workers remain attached to their current jobs, keeping businesses operating, including the port, and providing support for dislocated workers. To support these three pillars, the governor has convened the Intergovernmental Economic Response Team, which I chair. The response team includes representatives from our partners at the federal, state, and local levels, as you know, nothing can be done in a vacuum. It requires partnerships at all levels. The main priorities of our work include ensuring that the federal, state, and local programs are not duplicative of each other while maximizing their impact on Maryland businesses and workers, sharing data to ensure we are effectively reaching all affected communities, and that includes making sure that we provide information in Spanish and other languages. Deploying rapid response teams to businesses during the significant crises and creating a centralized repository of information where businesses and workers can readily access and identify all available programs and resources in a user-friendly manner. Since the group's first meeting, the following efforts have been accomplished. A third Small Business Administration Business Recovery Center, as, as the governor stated to earlier, opened up yesterday in Anne Arundel County. And today I had the pleasure of visiting this site. And it was incredible to see the dedication among the workers that are there. Not only are they providing services to small business uh, owners, but also they have wraparound services including providing services for mental health to making sure that they have rental and housing facilities and food pantries. Those are just some of the wraparound services that are being provided here. So big shout out to County Executive Stuart Pittman and his entire team for making that possible. Governor Moore, as you know, also signed an executive order to release $60 million in state resources to aid in financial relief for individuals and businesses. He also signed, as you heard, the Port Act into law just yesterday, which modifies eligibility requirements to meet the specific needs of port workers. We're grateful to the partnership of the entire Maryland General Assembly in making this happen so quickly. Finally, we're also grateful for the several local program initiatives that have been launched at the local levels from Baltimore County to Baltimore City to Anne Arundel County. These collective efforts will quickly provide resources to workers and businesses to help replace lost revenue and paychecks. When the block channels reopen, these initiatives will help businesses to remain in Maryland, maintain their workforce, and resume full operations. Thank you. And above and beyond all of this, our hearts, our prayers, and our thoughts continue for the victims and their loved ones. With that, I'd like to turn it over the microphone over to Admiral Guillory, who I have admired from day one since he started on Unified Command. Thank you. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for those kind words. First, I'd like to say thank you to all the members of the Unified Command and the great work that you have been doing. While I'm standing up here speaking on behalf of the Unified Command, the real work is going on by the people you see represented to my right and sometimes to our left. They are really doing the hard work that we need to have happen to restore commerce to the Port of Baltimore, and I couldn't be prouder of them. The beauty of a Unified Command is that every agency 
brings their authorities, their resources, and their expertise to the table in order for us to do things quicker and faster through unity of effort. In simple terms, that allows us to put the right person in the right place at the right time with the right piece of equipment to get this done as quickly as possible. And that's what's happening here in this unified command, and I'm so proud of all of their efforts. So to update you specifically on where we are, our priority one is reopen that deep draft channel. And we've made some significant progress along those lines. I'm gonna let Colonel Pinchason talk about that in a little bit more detail, but to highlight some of those things, in addition to all the planning that you've heard her talk about and that Captain Suarez has talked about, we are now actually beginning to be able to cut some of the steel on the top portions of some of those sections of the bridge inside the deep shaft channel. And that's tremendous progress, and we're really excited about that and what that means for us long term. And as the governor said, we are on track for those goals that have been set. Priority number two, is, again, is to remove the ship. And we're making progress there as well. And along those lines, as the governor mentioned, we are removing containers from the bow of the vessel. And the reason we're doing that is so that can give us better access to the bow so that we can safely remove those pieces of the bridge that are on top of the bow because that is essential to us to be able to refloat the vessel and remove it. So that's what we're doing with removing those containers and those, those operations will continue. The third priority is remove the rest of the bridge debris from the waterway. And the state and their contractors are making great progress along those lines and they have removed significant portions that were above the water. They've cut off significant portions above the water, put them on barges and transferred them back to Trade Point. So they're making great progress along those lines as well and I'm really proud of those efforts. So. I'd like to turn it over to Colonel Pinchason to give you more of an update on that priority one, restoring commerce to the deep draft channel. Thank you, Admiral. Governor Moore, thank you. Thanks for being here again today. It's an honor to be able to tell the story of all the hard work that our teams are making out there. As you know, our supervisor of salvage from the US Navy is coordinating the salvage operations across all three efforts and really maximizing the capability of that team. They're sharing lessons, they're applying them immediately, they're sharing information, equipment, expertise, and they're really designing our way ahead, step by step. It's inspiring to me as an engineer, but also as an American to be able to see that in action. And so I, I hope that everyone can take comfort in knowing that we've got the right team here, as, as Admiral just mentioned. What we're, ha what we're working towards right now, even though the focus is on opening the limited access channel, the 35 foot deep, 280 foot wide channel, the effort is ongoing throughout. The focus is to make sure that we're gonna provide some relief to the port, and I'll explain here. I think we have a graphic where we'll be able to talk about that effort right now, but I just wanna reassure everybody that while that's kind of front and center, we're gonna hit that at the end of April, we're still planning all the operations and synchronizing them, deconflicting resources, making sure that safety is still paramount in all that we're doing uh, throughout the entire waterway. So I think we're gonna move over, if we can, uh, to the graphic to explain the next key step. Apologize in advance. Can you hear me? Is this working? It's going to be hard for me not to geek out on the engineering stuff right now. No. Just one second. Give us one second. There we go. Thank you. There. Thank okay. So, so as Governor Moore explained. Whenever we're talking about the far side of the channel, we mean that we're talking about the area that's on the other side, away from the vessel. And I know that when we look at the skyline, I believe we have a picture. When you look at the skyline, you see these, these trusses that are going into the water, and our imagination tells us that that's how, how that might be further down. But we have a massive amount of wreckage, we call it a wreckage field or debris field, right in the middle. But 
this area, this big span is about 240 feet across. And this is the area that we're going to be cutting. We've actually started cutting it already. It's about 1,500 tons. And the salvers are tackling this by cutting it into two major sections. But what's really critical to this is to understand that this truss is actually going into, let's try that again. It's actually going into the water and into the mud line. So while up here, above the water, it's beautiful. You're able to see it. They can see what they're doing. As they're getting under the water, remember the water is extremely murky for those divers. How are you going to cut something that's under the mud line? So what they've done is up top, up top here, we're going to get it. We're going to get it. OK. OK. In this section here, they've actually created a gap by creating a hole in order to lower a bucket to be able to dig out the roadway and the debris that's laying on top of the bottom part of this truss. It's not that it's all just clean sitting there. The way that the wreckage came into the water, the roadway actually came all the way on top. So it's not exposed. They've actually had to dig it out in order to be able to cut it. And so they've, they are going to lower then, once they dig out and expose the cords on the bottom of the truss that they have to dig out, they're going to then lower the hydraulic shears. Divers are going to go into the water, place the hydraulic shears on the spans that they're going to cut. In here, once it's exposed, the divers are going to go up, and they're going to be able to cut them. Just explaining that, wrapping our heads around that, it's, it's hard to imagine. But that's what they're doing. And when you talk to them about it, that, I mean, that's, how they, that's what they do. That's what they're designed to do. And they explain it in such a methodical way that it's clear that we've got the right team handling this. But that 1,500 ton span is going to be broken up into 720 and about 794 tons each. And then we're going to see the Chessie in action, taking it out over to Sparrows Point. I'm looking forward to it. I'll be followed by Colonel Butler. Good afternoon. Thank you, Colonel Pachason, Governor Moore, Lieutenant Governor Miller. The Maryland State Police Aviation Command works around the clock to secure the airspace surrounding the site of the bridge collapse. We want to remind everyone, this is a no drone zone. On March 26, a temporary flight restriction, or TFR, was implemented by the Federal Aviation Administration at the request of the Maryland State Police. The FAA classifies the airspace above the site as restricted due to the bridge collapse. Under a recently modified TFR, for special security reasons, the restricted airspace extends from the surface to 1,500 feet above the bridge, or above the waterline, actually, and two nautical mile radius from the bridge. In accordance with the TFR, criminal penalties may be imposed for those that violate the restricted airspace. The safety and security of our personnel is of the utmost importance. The Unified Command, in partnership with local, state, and federal agencies, is committed to identifying, investigating, and prosecuting any unauthorized use of drones in the restricted airspace. Mayor Scott. Thank you, Colonel Butler, Mr. Governor, Ms. Lieutenant Governor. Uh, let me start uh, this afternoon, as I always do, by honoring uh, those families who continue to suffer uh, the most direct consequences of this unthinkable tragedy, uh, particularly those families of those who we lost on the bridge. And again, say to them that we are with you now and we will be with you forever. Uh, every single day, uh, we are hopeful that our efforts bring us closer to bringing them home and offering more closure to those families and our community as a whole. And I'm proud to, to be back here with this group after a brief hi hiatus, albeit for good reason. Uh, one, with the president's visit last week, and of course, Sonny died in the General Assembly ending earlier this week. Both of, both of those occasions, I think, are critical, critically important to this effort. 
I want to thank uh, the president again for his incredible partnership on this effort, making available every single resource uh, that we have needed, and we know he will continue to do that. His visit signifies the collaboration and partnership that we've had at every level of government throughout this entire process, and that is what is allowing us to move so quickly on such an aggressive timeline. I have to again say thank you and commend the Unified Command, Mr. Governor, and everyone on the progress that is being made every single minute, but most importantly, again, doing it all together. We continue to be hopeful as that timeline proceeds, of course, pending weather or any unforeseen circumstances. In the meantime, though, uh, we, in partnership with our, our federal and state partners at the local level, are continuing to do everything we can to take care of the families impacted by the closure of the Port of Baltimore. Uh, yesterday, I was uh, glad to stand uh, with the governor, the Senate president, Delegate Clippinger, uh, the speaker, and all the members in the General Assembly at the signing of the Maryland Port Act, bringing even more resources uh, to bear on this effort. So thank you, Mr. Governor, Mr. Senate President, Madam Speaker. Last week, I had a call with Acting HUD Secretary Todman, and she uh, brought up that if you can't pay your FHA insured mortgage due to the collapse of the bridge, you can contact your lender about temporarily pausing or reducing your monthly mortgage payment. HUD approved housing counseling agencies and stand ready to support. Additionally, uh, today I was proud to announce that the city of Baltimore has taken additional steps that are under our preview. Uh, we released an updated action plan this afternoon, which seems to bring together all the efforts being done uh, in partnership represented here and within city government. Uh, we outline a few additional items that in that action plan uh, that are being implemented as we speak. We're evaluating the addition uh, uh, of another $1 million to our previously announced wage subsidy program and new today, uh, we are announcing that we are offering utility bill and rental assistance to those families impacted by the port closure. We are going to run these programs through our existing program to support families who need assistance. I've directed uh, the entire city government to provide workers impacted by the bridge collapse access to energy assistance through the Maryland Energy Assistance Program and water bill support through the city's Water for All Assistance Program. Additionally, we'll be providing $500,000 into our ongoing uh, rental assistance program specifically for eligible port workers. These two buckets of support will be going directly to city residents impacted by this tragedy to help address one of the biggest looming problems, bills coming due when there's not much work to be had. More information on these programs, the entire action plan released today, and information on how to access assistance and other types of assistance offered by a variety of sources can also be find, found on our website. And I know uh, with the state standing up a central website as well, we'll make sure that all information is in one unified place as we've been throughout this tragedy in a unified measure. We want to continue doing everything that we can do to support Baltimoreans as they grapple with the fallout uh, to this tragedy. And I know we will continue to emphasize that same coordination and cooperation that has defined uh, this response thus far. And we will continue to do the most important thing, center the people impacted. And with that, I want to thank everyone again for their leadership, for their hard work each and every day, and turn it back over to my governor for questions. Thank you very much. So the, the 58 vessels that have come in and out are mostly barges and tugs. Um, I don't have all the information on their cargoes. We have had some additional vessels that have transited through, including the Pride of Baltimore, came back through last week. And so they made it back into port as well, sir. Uh, vessels do route at the trade point. Do we know how many of those have been I don't have the total number right off the top of my head, but it, there are several vessels that have called at Trade Point to offload cargo that had planned to call inside the where the bridge is at now. So sir. At, yes, sir. Some have called in there. Yes, sir.
So right now we're looking at our dredging options, but the, the digging that's taking place is just to clear the area in order to do some cutting of the trusses themselves. But the dredging, is, the dredging that may need to occur to free the vessel, like we did with the Ever Forward, that's still under, that's still under the planning phases. Let me show you. So we're very confident with this timeline because it is, it is science-based. We've had our engineers poring over this, and I'm proud to say they've been, they've been looking at this and analyzing this, arguing over this. The passion that you see them display when they are figuring out the right way to do it, engineering the lifts, engineering the operations, deconflicting and managing the resources that we have, this is a realistic timeline. And we are considering things like weather, we're considering things th like the unknown, we are making sure that we have time to go in and ensure that it's going to be safe that with each layer that we peel back, and we're looking to see how that load responded, how the wreckage reacted, that we're being methodical about it, and to use our Army phrase that slow is smooth and smooth is fast, right? It's so true because we're not going to rush to failure. We're going to take the time to make sure we get the engineering right, and that in turn will make it as fast and as safe as possible. Well, I can't give you the exact number of offenders that we have. We have a number that are being looked into closely by state and federal authorities. The biggest problem with the number of incursions that you have, it's a distraction to the workers. We are using drones for certain things to help them decide where to cut, when to cut. The moment a worker is distracted while cutting or doing anything else, they're at risk. They're cutting with some pretty severe equipment, the torches they're using. They're also looking out for a shift in the metal. All it takes is one moment for them to take their eyes off of what they're supposed to be doing. The metal shifts and they're at risk. So we cannot impress upon you enough. If you have a drone, stay away. Obey the no drone zone. Let the workers do their job. Let the workers stay safe. Well, I think it's extremely critical. When you are out at the port like the governor I've been and we're talking with those workers, when you talk to those small business owners, it's both. Uh, the support directly to the workers and the folks that need that assistance for, for rent or to pay their water bills, or if you need to, uh, for us to have that wage subsidy for a small trucking business that only has three employees that doesn't have any work, to be able to allow that company to stay afloat and those workers stay on. That, that prevents families from losing their homes down the line. That prevents people from not being able to cut the lights on. It's a critical thing, and we're so glad that all of us are in that work to do that, to protect that for those families and those workers together. Let 
my, my, my thinking is my entire focus right now is bringing comfort to these families and making sure that we can support these families, making sure that we can get these channels reopened and get commerce going again, uh, making sure that we can protect those and support those who have been impacted by this crisis right now to include family members and port workers uh, and first responders and making sure that we are going to get the, the bridge rebuilt. Uh, I think that any conversations uh, about anything else, uh, there will be time for any and, any and all of the conversations. But right now, if we're not focused on those four things, then we're being distracted. And just to add, I think that what we have to do, as the governor just said, there will be a time for that. But now is not that time. Uh, we haven't, these families haven't had funerals for their loved ones. We haven't recovered everybody. And we should be having those conversations, as we would say in church, in decency and in order. And when we, we would not want someone to be talking about renaming something if we lost a loved one that we haven't even had the ability to identify yet. We have to have those conversations in the future. And, and as the governor said, we will. But right now, we have to be focused on those families and how they would perceive that conversation about moving past uh, their loved ones to talk about a bridge uh, uh, that will be rebuilt in the future. Correct. Yeah, there, there were 4,000 vessels that were on the dolly uh, as they began the journey and as, and as the, it impacted the, the key bridge. We will not have to remove all 4,000 off in order to refloat the dolly. Uh, that's where the, the number came in, uh, the low number, the uh, 136 vessels. But eventually all will be removed, but, that's just, but the smaller number is what we're going to need in order to refloat the dolly. And that's a 24-7 operation? Uh, yeah, everything that's going on is a 24-7 operation. No, we haven't had any of that uh, information come across yet. It's something we're preparing for. We want to make this transition for the families and to get their relatives here. As the mayor said, so they can find closure. We're going to do everything to expedite that process once we get the information. No, we haven't. Not at this point. Here we are. Governor, I wanted to give you the chance to respond to something. Um, the NTSB chair, Jennifer Mundy, was in the was on Capitol Hill today. Um, she was testifying in the Senate, Senate for a renomination hearing. She obviously gave some updates on the investigation. And Senator Ted Cruz said he doubts that the federal government is fully recognizing this as an emergency. And he said he wonders if this was happening in China, the wreckage would have been cleared within days. What's your response? I'm sorry, Senator Cruz said the federal government is not recognizing this as a crisis? Um, I would say it was the federal government, and it was this administration who called my phone and all of our phones at 3 o'clock in the morning. It was the federal administration and the Biden administration who was on the ground that morning. It was the Secretary of Transportation who was on the ground literally as the sun was coming up. It was the federal administration that has been here and has been in constant communication with our administration, with Unified Command, with the mayor, with everybody else. I personally have not received a call from Senator Cruz. So I think the federal government, uh, you know, I'm not sure what, la what leg Senator Cruz has to stand on about responsiveness or connectivity to this issue. We'd love to welcome him. <laughs> 